Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you may know, if you've seen us before, we're doing studies on the, the Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School lessons for the fourth quarter of 2012. The series is entitled Growing in Christ, and this particular lesson is lesson number nine for December 1 of 2012. It's entitled The Church, Rites, and Rituals. Now, some of you are going to find that a fascinating subject. The rest of us, probably more fascinating after we talk about it for a while. But before we begin, we always like to ask the Lord, the Holy Spirit, to be near us and with us as we discuss. Shall we bow our heads? Our kind and wonderful Father, as we consider the questions and the advice that you have given us long ago, 2,000 years ago, the things you would like us to do and why you want us to do them. May we understand more clearly what you have to say. May we understand the part that you want us to play is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I hope you have your Bible handy. Some of these verses might be, or well, some of them will be very familiar. Some of them may not be so familiar. Uh, let's begin with an obvious one, and that's uh, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Presumably you may have me memorized this at some time back in your school days. My Good News Bible says, Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Go, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. So there are several commands. What were those commands again? Go, go, baptize, and teach. Baptize, baptize teach, teach, obey, make disciples. Yeah, it's okay. Well, we're going to focus on three ordinances. Okay, now, if you're in, you're in the military, this might mean something quite different. But in the church setting, what does an ordinance mean? It's a ceremony. It's something that the Lord has ordained, something that the Lord has asked us to do. Okay? He's placed his blessing on these things we're going to talk about. And we're going to focus on three, that is baptism, the Lord's Supper, and foot washing. Now, the question should be obvious. What is the role of, or purpose of rites or rituals? Do they have an important place in the church's activities? What does baptism, for example, mean to you? What does the Lord's Supper mean to you? Well, there's some very interesting verses that have raised some very interesting questions found in John chapter 6, starting with verse 43. Have a look at those verses. Once again, I'm reading from my Good News translation. Jesus answered, now, if you remember the setting here, the, the time has come when Jesus has fed the 5,000. Um, they're, they're getting organized on their way down to the Passover. Jesus does not plan to go to this Passover. He didn't go. And he, he taught, crosses the sea by night. He's back at Capernaum. They find, they find him a little bit later in Capernaum, realize that's where he is. And of course, they're waiting for breakfast. And he says, no, that's not the way things are going here. Uh, I have a different mission. I'm not just here to feed everybody. And so if you follow the story down, we come to verse 43. Jesus answered, Stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him to me, and I will raise him to life on the last day. The prophets wrote, Everyone will be taught by God. Anyone who hears the Father and learns from him comes to me. This does not mean that anyone has seen the Father. He who is from God is the only one who has seen the Father. I'm telling you the truth. He who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate man in the desert, but they died. But the bread that comes down from heaven and is of such a kind that whoever eats it will not, not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give him is my flesh, which I give so that the world may live. This started an angry argument among them. How can this man give us his flesh to eat, they asked. Jesus said to them, I am telling you the truth. If you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in yourselves. So I'm going to stop there for a second. Do you think there was a rush on him to have a bite? 
little bit of concrete no. thinking there somewhere. A little bit of concrete thinking? <coughs> well, I can tell you honestly that in the first and the second centuries, Christians were accused of being cannibalism because of these verses, of, of being cannibals. What is implied by eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Jesus? Catholics, uh, many of them believe like it's a little thing. Okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. In the ordinance that we call the Lord's Supper, we partake of a small wafer made of wheat and some fresh grape juice. Roman Catholics teach a doctrine known as transubstantiation. That's a huge, long word. In Greek, of course, transubstantiation is the Latin. In Greek, it's matusiosis. They believe that when the priest takes the Eucharist, that's the, the bread and the wine, each Sunday, the substance of the wheat and bread, wheat and grape wine, literally changes into the substance of the body and blood of Jesus. They admit that one cannot tell that by any tasting, smelling, looking, or touching, but they, stay, they say it still remains true. So in his evaluation of this doctrine, Martin Luther said that no, transubstantiation does not occur. In carrying out a ritual ceremony, human beings cannot turn simple substances into God. I mean, you think about it, what you're saying is a priest takes that wafer, holds it up, and he's actually creating God. Blasphemy. So he recommended a different approach called consubstantiation. This was Martin Luther's suggestion, in which he taught that as one eats the bread and the grape juice, he or she is taking the body and blood of Jesus with it. Does that make you feel better? Wars were fought over that difference. Yes. Is that a significant difference? No, not really. Not really. No. Verse 47 of chapter 6 that you read there a few seconds ago. Mm -hmm. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. And mm -hmm. this is early on. And John 17, 1 to 4, he says, Eternal life is to know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Mm -hmm. And there's okay. nothing about transubstanti <laughs> transubstantiation there. Yeah. So is there some alternative besides transubstantiation and consubstantiation? Well, let's, th let's think about that. That's a very good question. What, what is implied by the Lord's Supper? I mean, wh what are we tending to say? Is this a concrete thing? Is it, is it more like we are becoming one? We're remembering the Lord. We're remembering what He did. And we want to partake with Him. We're accepting Him into our bodies. We're remembering the Last Supper. We're remembering virtually everything from the beginning to the end of the Bible. It's okay. all pointing towards Christ. Now you remember this, this verses we been just read from John 6 happened at the end of his one year of Galilean ministry. Sometime later, well, this would be a year later, basically, he's in the upper room with his disciples on the last week of his human life, and he says there, he institutes this new ceremony, and he says, this do in remembrance of me. Do what? This is a reminder of my death until I come again, basically, right? So, what does that tell us about transubstantiation or consubstantiation? What, what it's a type problem, of memorial what, service. It's, it's a symbolic reminder of mm -hmm. his broken body and the blood that he shed, yeah. and that's all. What, what was the problem that the Catholics or Martin Luther was trying to solve anyway? What was the problem? Well, the problem is, you see, they would say that the priest has the actual power to transform a wafer, a piece of, of bread, into God. And why was that important? Because well, it puts him be, in equality to God. Yeah, it, it, well, in, in a sense, it means, what it really means is the, the church controls God and how he's going to be administered and how he's going to be given to people and so forth like that. It means the church is in co control really and not God. So the church has the power to turn that into something like that? Mm -hmm. That's the claim. That's the claim. And he, um, 
Well, Jesus says you must eat of the my flesh. Okay. And so maybe um, they're thinking that, okay, if we must do it, then that must really happen. Mm -hmm. But actually, you got to put the whole thing in contents, right? The context. Uh, context, mm -hmm. because they were expecting breakfast. Mm -hmm. Okay, how would you change the idea from breakfast to what Jesus wanted to talk about? Well, it's easy. You've got to eat me. Don't think about breakfast. Come and eat me, you know, type of thing. It's, it's an analogy. They get their minds over to what they're really supposed to be thinking about, I guess, not breakfast. I guess we have a saying, another analogy, you are what you eat. Mm -hmm. So let's dwell upon Jesus. Let's think about Jesus. Let's eat Jesus. Let's drink Jesus. Let's become one with Jesus. So we have a, a trouble confusing the or differentiating between the literal and figurative speech, the literal speech, the figurative speech. Yes. You know, which is it? Christ also made the point of that particular instance. He said, just because I've fed a lot of people before, I'm not, I'm not here to keep feeding people. Yeah. And then yeah. he switched it over and they didn't quite get what he was driving at. Did you, did you say it was a feast of booths where they would eat the, the, the um, sour or whatever, bitter, bitter herbs? Bitter. And that would make them remind them of their time when they were in captivity. Yes. So it looks to me that this is something very similar, that you get this piece of By the way, bread in the upper room, in the upper room, when we talk about the wine and the wafer, uh, the, the grape juice and the wafer, as we would say, what were they supposed to be eating? That's the bitter Passover. Herbs. Bitter herbs and Passover lamb. lamb and bitter herbs. Where is the Passover lamb and the bitter herbs? Jesus is the Passover lamb and the bitter herbs. So they didn't celebrate Passover that night. Well, they, that's probably implied, Jesus isn't is it? Jesus is the Passover. Okay. Well, well, so how we would they know that now, then? How would they know that then? We know that now, but if they did celebrate the Passover, that means they probably did that. Oh. If they were still doing it, um, traditionally back at that time, right? What did Jesus say they were supposed to be celebrating by, or we are supposed to be celebrating by doing this? <clears throat> we're supposed to be celebrating his death well, until he comes. Yeah, okay. Let us review some basic ideas. Many societies have initiation rites or rituals, sometimes called rites of passage. I spent 17 years in Africa, and I've been in some places where those rites of passage are pretty horrific. Some of these, those rites can be very gruesome, painful, or scary, but they are supposed to be to prepare children to enter life as adults. Uh, I know a place where young men were circumcised and basically banned to the woods, and this is an area where there's all kinds of cobras, and there's lions, and there's all kinds of creatures and so forth like this, and they're supposed to live on their own for a month surviving on their own, figuring out what they're going to eat, et cetera, et cetera, before they're allowed to come back. It's a pretty scary situation. Need some training for that. Yeah. Hopefully they learn something that will help them de to deal with the challenges of adult society. Well, the church also has certain rituals or rites to symbolize certain things. Remember, we're talking about symbols, and what's the function of a symbol? A reminder. A symbol always has a pointing function, a word. Basically, you, know, you hear a certain word, and what happens in your brain? An idea comes up, right? And it's connected with, I mean, if I say birthday, or I say 4th of July, or I say any other combination of words or, or single words, you immediately, your brain, without even you stopping to think about it, is associating that word with a certain collection of ideas that you've had from the past. That's what happens. But that's, that's more of a literal thing, though. That's a I mean, symbol. That's the function of a symbol. Everything we deal, everything is dealt with symbols. Yeah, sure. No, I'm not arguing with that. Words. But I'm just, I'm just pointing out that, that these things have, a, a symbols have a pointing function. They, they're not, you know, the, there's the fact that there's little bits of, of, of ink on a piece of pa paper doesn't mean anything at all by itself. Its only value is its capacity to point to something else. That's that's my. Mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. 
That is, we use the words to symbolize an idea. The church's rituals are to symbolize certain ideas. So if this is a symbolic or a ritual thing, then we need to look, okay, what is it supposed to remind us of? What is it supposed to point to, right? In the really very early days of Christianity, in the eastern part of the Mediterranean region, they practiced these rituals given by Christ. Now, we're looking at eastern Mediterranean. By contrast, uh, I'm sorry, in Greek they referred to them as the musterion or the mystery. That's what it was called back in those days. I don't know whether they called it mystery because they were trying to explain how this bread and wine could become a symbol of Jesus. I don't know why they called it mystery, but that's what they called it. In contrast, um, in the western part of the Mediterranean world, these rituals came to be known as sacraments. Now, what's a sacrament? It's an oath of allegiance. We're not well, okay a little bit. It's just a new word for what the others have been doing. It's okay. sort of an institutionalized thing. Well, a sacrament was originally an oath taken by a Roman soldier declaring his allegiance to his commander. An oath taken by a Roman soldier declaring his allegiance to his commander. Now, what would that imply? Commitment. Commitment? Lo loyalty. Loyalty. In the Middle Ages, the Roman Catholic Church settled on seven of these sacraments, which they believed the Christian must go through and which would, in actual fact, bestow power on the Christian himself. In other words, you get certain blessings, you get certain merits, etc., if you actually perform these rituals, okay? What are they? The seven sacraments were baptism, confirmation, anointing of the sick, the Holy Eucharist, that's the, the Lord's Supper that happens on Sundays, penance slash reconciliation, holy orders, that would be monasteries and nunneries and so forth, and marriage or matrimony. Now, most of these sacraments are fairly well understood by Christians, at least in the developed countries. It might be useful to describe penance or reconciliation as the Catholic Church understands it, because Protestants have tended to focus on some not so um, nice references to penance. So, to a Catholic, it, penance involves four elements. Okay, this is what they mean when they talk about penance. One, contrition or repentance. That's what has to come first, okay? It is assumed that the penitent one is sincerely sorry for the wrongdoing or sin which he has committed and therefore is, has sincerely repented. That's one, contrition, repentance. Two, he then confesses his wrong to the priest. Now this is what happens at confession. Who has been officially approved to hear confessions. You, you, only priests are officially approved to do that. Catholics admit that on, on occasions it may be useful to confess one's sins to, another, to one another as the Bible recommends in James 5.16. But only a priest has the power to administer this sacrament. So I can say, I'm sorry I, I hurt you, or I'm sorry I did whatever, and that may be useful, it may improve our relationship, but you can't turn around to me and say, okay, I forgive you on the Lord's, you know, on behalf of God. You can't do that, but a priest can't. Then three is comes the absolution by the priest, that is saying, bless you, you're forgiven. And four, satisfaction or penance. Thus the priest has the authority to forgive one of his or her sins and to make everything right. Now, do, what does the Bible say about who has the authority to forgive sins? Only God. Only God has the authority to forgive sins. Remember, that was what they accused Jesus of. And Jesus says, yeah, that's right. Only God can forgive sins. Watch me do it. Where does it say that? <laughs> huh? Where does it say that only God can forgive sins? Uh, when, in, in the yeah, story about the, the young man who was let down on a stretcher. In, yeah. In, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, where in the Old Testament does it say that? In the Old Testament? Yeah. Uh, any reference? I don't know. I, I don't remember any. Yeah, I don't. I don't, right offhand, I don't know. Well, the Jews cried out when they lowered him down, only that's what they cried out. Only God has that authority. No, no, what happened was this, actually. He, they let him down on that stretcher. And Jesus looked at him and said, Son, your sins be forgiven. And the Pharisee sitting there says, "Who? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And then Jesus says, Oh, yeah? 
That's exactly right. Let me show you. And of course, their thinking was, in order for the man to be healed, his sins must be forgiven. See, because how, why, is he, why does he have this illness? Because, well, because he's a sinner. So sinners are be God is punishing him for this thing. So in order to heal him, you have to forgive his sins, according to their thinking. So Jesus says, okay, if you're going to think like that, let me show you. Young man, get up, walk away. The young man got up and walked away. Therefore, yes, Jesus has the power to forgive sins. That was, that was the argument there. And at one point, didn't he give some type of authority to all? Forgive each other your sins. Well, that was a responsibility or, yeah. a, or right. a command to, give, right. to be forgiveness. And the guy says, well, seven times. And when he said, no, 70 times seven. Yeah. And Didn't it wasn't say start right. counting. No, it right. says always forgive, always be right. forgiving. Right. Didn't, we are, didn't we say somewhere back that um, God has already forgiven sins? Yeah. So if he's already forgiven them, well, then why does he have to forgive? Well, there's two parts to that. One is, has God forgiven us? And the answer is, he's already forgiven us. The second part is, who has the power to forgive sins? Only God. So it that, doesn't... That, it, that suggests that there was a time where he didn't... didn't. No, 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 it doesn't. It just suggests that he, he forgives well, us... Well, the way you put it, it does. Well, let me try to say it in a better way then. Okay. <laughs> what, it, what it's saying is... God is the only one who has the power to forgive sins, and he did that long ago. He did it back before, in the, the, Revelation 14 says, before the creation of the world. That's where God is. He is forgiveness personified, mm -hmm. and his graciousness. The, God is gracious. That's his very nature. Yeah. Well, he's the one that's going to verify that he, your sins are forgiven. Right. He's the only one that can verify that your sins are forgiven. But as you mentioned, Jesus, when uh, he wanted to teach us how to, uh, us how to pray, he said we have to forgive each other. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to mention one other thing. When I was growing up, my mom, we became Seventh-day Adventists, but my father was a real uh, Catholic. And I went through this. Mm -hmm. When I was seven and a half, I went through this. You study, then you go, you see the priest off and on, and, and then you go, one day you get all dressed up. I got all dressed yeah. up, and I had to remember mm -hmm. verbatim yeah. a lot of things. And then he told me, when you do go and you say, oh, I did this, I hit my brother, he tells you, go over there and say seven this and three this, and then you're good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And you're good. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't we uh, kind of all made in a, in a way priests? We're a nation well, of priests. We followers, followers of yes. We believe and, and as Seventh Day Adventists, we believe that we, we believe in a thing that's called the priesthood of all believers. That's not a biblical term, but it's basically Jesus told us. He said, "You know, I give all. I give you all this function, all this job." Now, let me just, maybe I can expand on that a little bit so we can understand it more clearly. Look at Matthew um, 16, verse 18. Um, now, this is a special verse. You remember, Jesus has taken them far north into the ter into Gentile territory, and while he's up there, and they're surrounded by these pagan idols and so forth, Jesus says to them, okay, who do you think I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And in verse 17, good for you, Simon, son of John, answered Jesus, for this truth did not come to you from any human being, but it was given to you directly by my Father in heaven. And so I tell you, Peter, you are a rock, and on this rock foundation I will build my church, and not even death will ever be able to overcome it. And, of course, the Catholic Church take that to suggest that... Um, you know, they believe that the church is built on Peter and that thenceforth uh, that power has been handed down from one pope to another until the present day. But those, those two rocks are different rocks, correct? They're different one rocks. Is a pebble. But there's, that's not the rest of the story. Um, let me turn over to Matthew 18. If I can get to the You're Matthew 16, 18, is that what you just read? Yes. And as, as I heard you, maybe I misheard it, it says, I tell you, you are a rock, is that, did you say? Rock. The RSV says, you yeah. are Peter in capital, capital mm -hmm. Peter, 
counting then the footnote says uh, Greek is Petros. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, right. Okay. And upon this rock, Petra. So that's a different, a, a different, different format. A different rock. Larger. And it goes on. If you read a little further down, it says, you know, I will give you the, the power to forgive sins and keys and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you look over at Matthew 18, 18, it wasn't just Peter who got the keys. Look at Matthew 18, 18. It says, and so I tell all of you what you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven and what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Mm -hmm. So all of us, if you will, are Peters. Right. And I, well, I tell you even more, whenever two of you on earth, are, agree, on earth agree about anything you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, I am there with them. So that's part of it. There's a lot more. If you go to Ephesians 2, it'll say, yes, the church is built on Peter. The church is built on Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, but it's Peter and all the other apostles and prophets, and every one of us is supposed to be a stone in that building. So all of us are supposed to be part of that church building. Another analogy, many parts of one body. Mm -hmm. that, would be, that would be 1 Corinthians 12. So we do believe. We don't believe in sacraments as Seventh-day Adventists, but we do believe that Christ has ordained or given us certain rites or rituals that he has asked us to practice as we look forward to the Second Coming. And what's the purpose of those? Reminders. Reminders. They're symbols. They point things. They're supposed to remind us of things that have happened in the past, and in some cases to point forward to things we expect to happen in the future, right? So we call those things ordinances. They were ordained by Jesus. So what is it that Christ has asked us to do? Well, we already mentioned Matthew 28, 19, 20. What did it say there? Go. Go make disciples. Make disciples. Baptize. Baptize. And teach. And teach. Okay? So that's what he's asked us to do. Look at a couple of other places. Look at John 13, verse 14. I, your Lord and teacher, now this is, now we're talking about the Last Supper now. I, your Lord and teacher, have just washed your feet. You then should wash one another's feet. It's another command that he's given us. Okay? And let's look at, there's one more. Try 1 Corinthians 11, for, starting with verse 23. I, for I received from the Lord, this is Paul speaking, the teaching that I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took a piece of bread, gave thanks to God, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is God's new covenant, sealed with my blood. Wherever you drink it, whenever you drink it, do so in memory of me. So, eating the bread and drink the drinking the cup are for what purpose? Remember. Reminders. To reminders. They're reminders. Like, I like the way that's stated. This is my body, which is for you. Mm-hmm. He gave, he gave his body for us. Okay, very good. Um, we, we are therefore told to, to, to celebrate, to commemorate by the washing of feet and the taking of the Lord's Supper. We do not believe that we somehow gain merit by performing these acts. They are simply supposed to be reminders of what Christ has done for us. Is that important? Yeah, it is. They are outward symbols of some very important events which have happened in history and which are supposed to be reflected in our lives. So what happens to food when we take it in? It gets it digested. Becomes part of a part person. Of you. Mm -hmm. Energizes and becomes part of it. Are. Part of it's turned into energy so that we can go on with our biological processes. And part of it becomes protein and building blocks for us to restore parts of our body that are breaking down and so forth. There's breaking down and replacement all the time going on. So we literally, that stuff literally becomes a part of us. Okay? Well, and really what you question. are is, mm -hmm. is your brain. That's where you do your thinking. That's what yeah. you really are. My yeah. family, we, we kind of think it, I, I know we do communion inside of the church, but uh, every meal that we have, we have we take a little piece of bread and a little juice, mm -hmm. and so we have communion at every meal. Okay. Is that wrong? No. No. The reason the Advent, 
the what? reason the Adventist Church has chosen not to do it real commonly, like the Catholic does it, Catholics do it every Sunday, we've chosen not to do it because we think that it, it can become too much of a ritual and so people don't even think about what they're doing. So that's why we tend to, to do it less frequently. Yes, you wanted to say something. Mm -hmm. On paragraph seven, mm -hmm. I, the, when you mentioned the seven sacrament, okay, the last word, matrimony, uh, are they speaking in the way that you know people get married, women, or are they speaking also priests that supposedly and nuns that marry Christ? No, they're talking about regular, regular marriage. Regular marriage. Yeah. Okay. By the way, if you would be interested in in having the handout materials that we use in our classes to guide us in our discussion. They are available at any time at our website. It's theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. That's theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And you get the audio, I mean, you get these printed handouts if you want to download in PDF format. You can listen to audio recordings of our classes. All kinds of stuff there available. Help yourself. Including this video. Including this video. Ken, just a quick question. So the priests themselves, they would not be obligated to, to fulfill the seventh sacrament, which is matrimony? No. But they're, they're obligated to perform the sacrament for others. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, just one little question. Mm -hmm. if, if this is important to remember Christ, mm -hmm. Then what happens when we read about him in the Bible? What's the well, difference? Well, that's another way. It's another way to remember him. But um, we need as many different ways as we can we can possibly. I mean, when I run in the mornings and I'm running up over the hills and I'm listening to stuff, maybe, or I'm thinking about him. That's another way to learn so more. So it's about just a way. It's not. There is anything way. deep the, about the two. Okay. Well, <laughs> it we the Bible. The, we think it's important. It, it's not magic, mm -hmm. not magic, but it's important, okay? But the foot washing also teaches us something. Yeah, we're going to get to that in a moment. Well, let's, let's, we're, let's go to baptism first. What, what's the point of baptism? Well, look, look at a few verses. Look at Acts chapter 2, starting from verse 38. Peter said to them, now this is Pentecost we're talking about now. Peter said to them, each one of you must turn away from your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins will be forgiven and you will receive God's gift, the Holy Spirit. For God's promise was made to you and your children and to all who are far away, all whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So, and he goes on, save yourselves from the punishment coming on this wicked people. Many of them believed his message and were baptized and about three thousand people were added to the group that day. That's a pretty remarkable response. You know, the disciples a few weeks before that thought there were only 11 of them left. And now look at this. So they spent the time, their time in learning from the apostles, taking part in the fellowship, and sharing in the fellowship meals and the prayers. Do you think okay. that response was totally from them? Or was it the response Partly because of all the things that had happened before. Oh, sure. Of course. Because sometimes... This is a reaping. This is a reaping. Yeah. Okay, so um, I just... Some people think that, um, that you can go out to in the middle of nowhere and preach a little bit and that possibly thousands of people will be baptized because of your little bit of preaching. No. But that's, that's not... not what God intends. That's not um, exactly what happens. No. There's, is, there's more to it than that. Well, and Paul says, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, in the same way all of us, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether slaves or free, have been baptized into the one body by the same Spirit. And we have all been given the one Spirit to drink. So, and if we had time, we would look back at uh, the rest of the, study the rest of this chapter where basically it says if you're, if you're really Christians and you really go through this experience, then you, should, you are joined to the body of Christ and some are ears and some are eyes and some are feet and some are hands. You know the, the story there. We don't all do the same thing, but we're all part of the body, right? Um, so the verses say clearly that being baptized it represents what? 
a turning away from sin through, through repentance and, and, and receiving forgiveness, entering into a new birth experience. You remember John 3 and Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus and receiving the Holy Spirit. Based on the, by the way, what is the receiving of the Holy Spirit? If you read on through the book of Acts, that was the key to what was really important. If a person had really become a Christian, then he received the Holy Spirit. Many people uh, uh, correlate that with the ability to speak in tongue when it's really... Okay, if you talk about the kind of speaking in tongues that happened at Pentecost, what happened there? A gift of ears. A gift of ears, okay. They could, if you read the book Acts of the Apostles by Ellen White, she says, after that experience, the disciples went forth, and wherever they went, they could speak the local language fluently and consistently. And be understood. And be understood. Amazing. Well, a number of modern Christian groups have given up the idea of baptism by immersion. That would be going completely under the water and coming back up again. And we know that the uh, Roman Catholic Church, once again, administers baptism by sprinkling, preferably to newborn babies. Now, it just so happens that my wife and her whole family, um, there were six of them all together, children, had the same doctor and the same nurse that performed the deliveries and so forth. Well, it turns out that the doctor was a Seventh-day Adventist, and that's why they went to him. But the nurse was a Roman Catholic, and she was determined that every child that was born under her watch would be baptized. So all of my wife's family had a little bit of water sprinkled on them at birth. Does that make them now safe to save? Oh, it might but be a little... Not an hour. <laughs> You've got to have accountability. It, it covers all your bases. <laughs> <laughs> but they were worried that if a child died before yeah. they did that, they would be lost forever. Yeah. Is but the there's been some people that were so set against being sprinkled that they would just about go through the roof if anybody did anything like that. Yeah. But it's, yeah. what difference does it make? Well, you see, they believe in original sin. And you need to have that sprinkling to deal with original sin. If you don't deal with that original sin, you're lost. Isn't in the Jewish tradition, uh, and also Christian tradition, I, I imagine, uh, isn't there an age of accountability? Eight years old or 14 years old? 12. 12, 12 years right. old. Yeah. Jews, well, yeah. depends on, yeah. Accountability starts about age seven, but you're ready to become an adult and be treated like an adult at age 12. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, this sprinkling business, and, and, and if you go to the Eastern Mediterranean, they do it a little more vigorously with pouring. You have a pitcher and, shh, you know, they <laughs> pour some water on you. Well, uh, this has been carried on for hundreds of years. Many biblical scholars have recognized that there's no basis in Scripture for sprinkling. The Church of England decided some time ago that, and I quote, the recipients of baptism were normally adults and not infants. This is in the Bible. And it must be admitted that there is no conclusive evidence in the New Testament for the baptism of infants. infants. That's uh, from a, a book from in 1955 baptism and confirmation today. If in fact bapti baptism is to follow a sincere understanding of one's sins followed by repentance and a change of attitude toward God, this would be impossible for an infant. I don't think any of us have any questions about that. Now there was a, somebody told me, I don't know if it's true or not, that, that back in England that, that there was a plague or some sort of uh, disease in the water or something that made them not do immersions oh, because I, I don't know about that. Uh, somebody told me about okay. that I should I should get more information on that before I bring it up I guess well once again notice that if you believe baptism as a sacrament and a way of gaining favor in God's eyes by bringing about a transformation in a person from spiritual death to life it is entirely a supernatural event done by God and does not involve any understanding or change on the part of the individual. So if you believe that, that at infancy you can sprinkle a few drops of water on a, on a baby and God will, will take away his, his um, you know, 
sins his, that he didn't commit, that his ancestors committed, if you, if you take away that original sin or, and so forth, and you actually transform that person's status before God, then, and you don't have to do anything, then that would make sense. However, those of us who believe that baptism is an ordinance ordained by Jesus, given, uh, see, we see it as a symbol of a supernatural event. That is, the believer has come to understand that he's a sinner, that he needs to change, and he accepts the life and death of Jesus on his behalf. There, there seems to be a, <clears throat> a conflict within the word sacrament in dealing with mm -hmm. baptism. I heard earlier a sacrament was uh, an oath or an allegiance. Yes. So an, that would be impossible anyways for an infant to make yes. that oath or that allegiance. Yes. So isn't baptism also a public um, statement yes. of your belief in and allegiance to God? Yes. Yeah, the baptism in the water. Remember, there's also a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's kind of a physical activity, too, to, to mark it for yourself. Yeah. Well, when did foot, foot washing first appear in the scriptures? What's interesting, it's way back in Genesis. In Genesis 18, 4 is the first reference to it. Abraham offered to wash the feet of Jesus and his angels that came with him. In Genesis 19, 2, Lot offered to wash the feet of those same angels when they came down to Sodom. In Genesis 24, 32, Laban and Rebekah offered to wash the feet of Abraham's servant. God instructed the priests and Levites who were ministering in the tabernacle to regularly wash their hands and feet as they carried out their sacred responsibilities. Remember, there was that labor there, that place for, for washing uh, between the altar and the tent. In all these examples, it seems clear that the purpose of the foot washing and or hand washing was a matter of cleanliness as well as ritual. So what is the ordinance of humility, as we sometimes call it? Well, we need to read a few verses. Look at Luke 22, starting with verse 24. An argument. Now, here's the disciples and Jesus have just gotten into the upper room. Okay? It's the last night of Jesus' human life. Okay? An argument broke out among the disciples as to which one of them should be thought of as the greatest. Where are they? This is the last night of Jesus. They're in the upper room. And they're, they're quietly. Oh, no, 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 they've, been, than you. they've been with Jesus for several years. Three and a half years, some of them. Yeah, and they're still arguing about who's going to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, the kings of the pagans have power over the, their people. And the rulers claim the title friends of the people. But this is not the way it is with you. Rather, the greatest one among you must be like the youngest and the leader must be like the servant. Who is greater, the one who sits down to eat or the one who serves? The one who sits down, of course, but I am among you as one who serves. You have stayed with me all through my trials, and just as my Father has given me the right to rule, so I will give you the same right. You will eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones to rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. Boy, they were all excited about that. I mean, that's exactly what they wanted, right? So then things happened, and re what happened a little bit later? Nobody came forward, so Christ <coughs> took the job. Exactly. <coughs> exactly. Jesus, Jesus himself ended up bowing down and washing their dirty feet. Look at Matthew 18, verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus asking, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And what did he say? The greatest in the kingdom of heaven, verse 4, is the one who humbles himself and becomes like a child. And whoever welcomes in my name one such child as this welcomes me. Okay? And uh, if, well, let's look at verse, chapter, Matthew 20, verse 21 as well. Uh, remember here, the, the mother of James and John came to him and said, Jesus said, what do you want? And she answered, promise me that these two sons of mine will sit at your right and your left when you're in, you are king. So that's what they all wanted, right? What happened? Incredible as it may seem, in the upper room, the disciples were quietly arguing among themselves about who was the greatest. Try to imagine how Jesus felt as he saw them arguing among themselves about that. He wondered what he could do to change their attitude. 
as we know now, he did something incredible. The upper room had been prepared. There was a pitcher full of water and a basin, but none of the disciples moved to wash anyone else's feet. Eventually, Jesus stood up, took off his outer garment, picked up the pitcher and the basin, and began to wash his disciples' feet. You know the story. We don't have time to read it all now. Rome, uh, I'm sorry, John 13, verses 1 to 17. Why do you think John is the only, one, only gospel writer who tells this story? Nobody else Have you ever asked that question? What? Nobody else wanted to admit it. Okay. That's part of it, the reason, I'm sure. His gospel was the last written. I'm not sure what that has to do with it, but I, I've been thinking about this, and I don't know what the answer is. Okay. <laughs> Waiting for yours. Anybody? Also, also, maybe he was, because he was so young at the time, mm -hmm. he was really impressed with this. The master. There, there's probably another reason. The first two Gospels were written with the, well, the, the first three Gospels were written by people who, at a time when the Jewish temple and the Jewish nation was still intact. And this teaching by Christians would have been very obnoxious to Pharisees and to Jews in general. Probably the reason they didn't, they didn't, talk, about, they didn't talk about it. John wrote his gospel long after the Jewish nation was completely gone. The temple had been destroyed. There's none of that left. There's no pride in Jewish nationality, whatever. It's all gone. And now John says, okay, let's talk about rituals and ceremonies that are truly Christian. And this is one of them. And now I'm free to talk about it. But John also likes mentioning water quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> He has a love, yeah. He uses the water a lot. Well, clearly in Jesus' day, the disciples' feet were quite dirty, yes. Now, John doesn't at least not very much mention the, the wafers and the, no. and the grape juice. Why not? It was, that was a ceremony that was supposed to take the place of the Passover. He's not focus, so much focusing on Jewish ceremonies now. He wants to fo focus on things that are purely Christian. What usually happens in a situation like that? Do people normally just get up and wash each other's feet? Or no, what they? normally happens is as you come into the house, a servant is there waiting to meet you. you you're seated and he washes your feet. So, oh. There was no servant. servant was, the, the stuff was there. A servant was supposed to be there. And for whatever reason, the servant was not there. Jesus probably said, you can go home tonight. Well, <laughs> well, that was going to be my question. Because the custom was, if you had enough finance to hire that, you were going to get a servant and the equipment. Now, did they just have enough to get where they were, or did Christ yeah. know what was going to happen and just leave it? Well, they had all the equipment there, mm -hmm. so somebody put all that there. So I well, would. Well, clearly, doubt. we see we can see today that Jesus gave the ultimate example of servant leadership yeah. by kneeling down and washing the disciples' feet. What does that say to us about God? He's Was that God kneeling down there? Yeah. Absolutely. You're sure? Absolutely. He's, he's got our best interests at heart, but it's also a great leveler as far as we're concerned. But surely the Father, the sovereign God of the universe, wouldn't do that, would he? He well, really loves most us. The, most <laughs> of the uh, Unitarian religions wouldn't think in those terms. Well, it looks like it looks like heaven is kind of uh, structured upside down, where you have instead of having a hierarchical mm -hmm. order, you've got something going down mm -hmm. to the bottom. Mm -hmm. Well, when he says, "I'll call you servant," no longer call you servants, I'll call you friends. That's basically a horizontal relationship. Mm -hmm. Well, but listen sure to these isn't. very interesting words from Ellen White, which aren't often quoted because a lot of people have this hierarchical idea. Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, humbling himself, veiling his glory, that humanity might look upon him, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed and unfolding its record of his own condescending grace. And every act of Christ Every act of, of Jesus, I'm sorry, and every act of Jesus and every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. 
in sight and hearing and effect, says it again, she says it again, it is the voice and movements of the Father. That's uh, letter 83, written 1895. It's found in that, that I May Know Him, page 338, paragraph 4. It's also in a source that's not easily available, but is more detailed. Volume 21 of the manuscript releases, page 393, paragraph 1. It's, it's interesting, though. It sounded like if they would switch, it wouldn't make any difference. But then she says at the end that he was God. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily switching. Difference. It's not necessarily switching. It's, it's the fact that they are equal. equal. The di disciples must have been shocked at first when he did that. Ultimately, most of them were humbled. Judas was disgusted. How could someone he was planning to force into a position of king of the Jews be down on his knees washing dirty feet? I mean, this is disgusting. Could this be the supreme commander of the universe, the creator of all things, kneeling down and washing dirty feet? You think I, he thought that? Mm -hmm. I don't think he did. Not no, until he, after. no, he thought, why is this man, I'm trying to get him, I'm trying to get this guy to wake up and realize he needs to be king. No, okay. How can an earthly king be washing dirty feet? That's what he thought. Okay, I, yeah, yeah. As parents, we love our children and we change diapers. Yeah. So I don't see that far we move. <laughs> I don't see that far we like move. like a true mother, huh? Yeah, from what God, Jesus did for us. Yeah. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. no comments. After, wa <laughs> <laughs> after washing those dirty feet, Jesus returned to the table to lead out in the service. Did Jesus have to wash his own feet? Did any of the disciples offer to wash Jesus' feet? No evidence for it whatsoever. They were well, probably so ashamed that mm -hmm. they I probably thought. couldn't even look at him, yeah. let alone wash his feet. The, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is one of only a very small group of Christian denominations still practicing actual foot washing. Has that become an outmoded ritual? We do not walk around in sandals on dusty streets anymore, or at least most of us don't. Does this make it not so meaningful? Well, let's turn to the Lord's Supper now. What does it mean to you? Well, circumcision, remember all the discussion about circumcision in the Bible, it was supposed to be a sign to, of a Jewish male's allegiance to his re religion throughout his life. In Christian times, baptism is supposed to represent our entrance into the Christian life. The Lord's Supper is supposed to represent the renewing of that commitment that we made when we were baptized on a regular basis. Just as the Passover represented the liberation from Egypt, Egyptian bondage for the Jewish people, under the Old Covenant, the Lord's Supper represents our liberation from the old life of sin and its consequence, death. And you remember Romans 6, 23, sin pays its wage, what is it? Death. death. The food that we eat, we've talked about this a little bit already, is digested and processed and changed until it can become an integral part of our body or be used to provide the necessary energy to stay alive. 1 Corinthians 11, 24 to 26 talks about this. We don't have time to read it right now. As we eat and drink of the Lord's Supper, we are symbolizing the idea that through the church and its rites and rituals, we have accepted the teachings and life of Jesus and that we plan to make it an integral part of our lives. That's what the ceremony is supposed to mean. I do this because I want the Jesus experience to be a part of my life. Baptism and the Lord's Supper, it's an extension over time. The, the Lord's Supper is, is in effect repeating that ritual. Remind us that we are part of a sinful but joyous Christian community. Very thankful for what Christ has done for us. Look at 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. That means that every time you eat this bread and drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until when? Until he comes. You proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Okay? In these verses, Paul suggested that the ordinance of the Lord's Supper is not just to look back over our lives and ask for forgiveness for our post-baptismal sins. It is much more than that. 
It is supposed to help us look forward to the second coming of Christ. During that interval, while we are waiting, we are proclaiming the truth of all that Jesus accomplished by his life and his death, everything he did. So what is the relationship between the first coming and all that Christ did at that time and the second coming? Well, think about this for a moment. If Jesus did not plan to come back the second time, what, would be, what was accomplished by his first coming? There would be no point, would there? For coming and doing what he planned to do if he never planned to come and get us and take us to heaven? The Lord's Supper should at least in part help us to understand the relationship between the first and the second comings. Jesus himself suggested that in Matthew, suggested that in Matthew 26, 29. He promised a close and personal relationship with us, saying that he would not drink of the wine until he drinks it again with us. He is looking forward to the day when we can all gather around the table in heaven and together enjoy the perfect grape juice of heaven. Can you imagine what that might taste like? So what does the cross mean to you? How does your understanding of the meaning of the cross help to prepare you for the second coming? And now I quote from the Spirit of Prophecy, volume one, page 201. The Passover pointed backwards to deliverance of the children of Israel and was also typical pointing forward to Christ, the Lamb of God, slain for the redemption of fallen man. The blood sprinkled upon the doorpost prefigured the atoning blood of Christ and also the continual dependence of sinful man upon the merits of that blood for safety from the power of Satan and for final redemption. Understanding what Christ has done for us is absolutely essential for our salvation. Think back of the time when you were baptized. Was it a time of serious Christian commitment? Do you think of that occasion every time you participate in the ordinance of humility and the ordinance of the Lord's Supper? Do we as Christians need very concrete examples like this to remind us of these important teachings? Why do you think Jesus gave us these rituals? Every organization has them. Meals taken together have had special meaning to virtually all groups and societies down through history. Think of what taking a meal together means to your family. Having once again studied these rites and rituals, how do you feel about them? Would you be just as happy if the church dropped them? Think about it as, we, as you study this lesson. We'll see you next week.